Hello, welcome to Art History. Today's lecture will focus on some of the earliest known art in the Andean region. Um, we'll also spend some time uh, looking at the culture at Chavin de Huantar, um, and we'll start to look at some of the earliest expressions of textiles, uh, sculpture, um, architecture, pyramid building, um, and uh, religious cults that um, have been discovered in the Andean region. This week's reading goes along with chapter two in Art of the Andes from Chavin to Inca by Rebecca R. Stone. So we'll start out by looking at some of the earliest Andean art. Um, we'll jump uh, into the lithic period, the pre-ceramic period, and the initial period, um, looking at architecture, sculpture, um, and textile and fiber arts. Um, and then we'll really focus a lot on uh, the culture of uh, Chavin um, at Chavin de Huantar. Um, and we'll look at some of its influence in uh, the broader region um, on the coast of uh, modern day Peru. So uh, let's start by uh, just talking a little bit about chronology and where we're going to be uh, looking at chronologically today. Um, just as a reference, page seven of your textbook does have a time scale um, with approximate dates for different cultures. So uh, you may wanna put a bookmark in page seven of your textbook. Uh, today's lecture, we'll look at the lithic period, which is from 10,000 to 3000 BCE. Um, we'll look at the cotton pre-ceramic period. So um, the Andes region is unique compared to a lot of other uh, cultural areas around the world in that um, they developed a uh, textile um, artistry and textile technology before they started firing ceramics. Um, so we do see that here in the Andes. Um, the initial period is from about 1800 to 800 BCE. And then the early horizon period, which we'll just get into a little bit with the end of the Chavin culture, is from 800 to 200 BCE. So we are all going to be looking at times BCE. So we'll be looking at artwork um, as old as perhaps 11,000 years old today. So um, in the lithic per uh, period, we'll be looking at um, Guitarero Cave and the Chinchuros culture. Um, cotton pre-ceramic period, we'll look at Waka Prieta, Carl Supes, and the Chico Norte um, culture, uh, Katosh. Um, and then the initial period, we'll look at uh, the location of Pampa de las Lamas Mojeque, um, Garage, Cerro Sechin, uh, and Chavin de Huantar. And Chavin de Huantar is the only culture we'll be looking at in the early horizon period. Next uh, week's lecture will be on um, the Paracas and Nazca, which also exist in the early horizon period. So today we'll just focus on Chavin. So starting out, um, with the earliest known uh, carbon dates that we have for dating um, art in this region, we have as early as 8,000 BCE. We have basketry fragments found at Guterrero Cave. Um, starting around 5,500 BCE, we have the first artificial mummification in the world in what is now Chile. Um, now, just so you know, this does predate the Egyptians um, technology of purposefully um, artificially mummifying their dead. So we actually have the first mummification here in the Americas, which um, a lot of people don't know that. Um, it's uh, a lot of this uh, scholarship in the Americas, a lot of what I'm telling you in this lecture um, has is coming from information that has been gathered since the 1990s. Some of this, some of these discoveries ha have been made um, in the 21st century. So there's a lot of new information um, and uh, the fact that the coast of Peru is so dry is one of the reasons why we have um, the ability to carbon date uh, organic material. So just as a reminder, you need organic material or material that was once alive, um, like plants, like animals, uh, like textiles made from cotton or grass, uh, something that was once alive, uh, you can test for um, carbon dating. Um, so that's pretty exciting that we have organic material that's been preserved for so long on the coast um, in these really dry climates. Um, starting around 3000 BCE, um, we have the Norte Chico and Carl Supe uh, culture. Um, and then uh, we don't really see fired ceramics being widespread until about 1800 BCE, uh, but we do have traces of it starting um, 
around this time period. Um, this is, of course, the region we'll be looking at um, today uh, here on the west coast of South America in focusing in what is today Peru. So let's start with the lithic period. Um, lithic uh, refers to stone. Um, so again, in many different regions of the world, we have different time periods and uh, ways to date things. So we'll start with the lithic period, which goes from around 10,000 to 3000 uh, BCE. Um, and again, some of the earliest basketry is found at Guterrero Cave, around 10,000 to 11,000 years old. Um, and we also have, uh, we have twined cloths being made without looms, um, starting around 5,000 years ago in Waka Prieta. So let's take a look at Guterrero Cave. Um, this is located um, near the coast in Peru, but not totally um, right on the coast. Um, here we have evidence of 10,000 year old basketry. Um, this basketry was probably used as fishing nets, fishing baskets. Um, some scholars have proposed that they may actually have been making traps for fish out of this uh, woven material um, or using them as mats. So these plant fibers were looped, twisted, and knotted to make containers. And um, the uniform techniques that we see show mastery of specific techniques. So it shows us that these, um, the basketry that we are seeing that's been dated to around 10 or 11,000 years ago was not the first time they had tried this technique. So it had shown a lot of mastery. Um, and here is an example. Here's a close-up of one of these. So this is basketry fragments with interlaced technique. Um, these were discovered in the cave of Guterrero. Um, and these ones are dated to around 8,000 BCE, uh, which comes out to around 10,000 years ago. Um, this shows the technique of interlacing. Um, this is a technique that you do not need a loom for. Um, you have rigid um, pieces of grass or plant um, going vertically, and then you take two strands of a more flexible plant fiber and interweave them together. And when they are tightly knit together, uh, you can create um, very uh, effective containers for storing and moving things. Let's move along the coast to uh, the Chinchuros culture. Uh, the Chinchuros culture um, was a, a pre-ceramic fishing society. Uh, they inhabited the Atacama coast of southern Peru and northern Chile from about 720, uh, 7,020 to about uh, 1,110 or so BCE. Um, and they first started mummifying their dead around 7,000 years ago or around uh, 5,500 BCE. Um, again, this is about 5,000 or about 500 years before the Egyptians started artificial um, mummification processes. Uh, and again, this coastal desert um, has created an environment that was very, um, you know, uh, it was very conducive to preserving things. So um, some anthropologists have uh noticed the presence of natural arsenic um, in the uh, Camarones River, uh, around 100 times higher than modern safety levels. Um, and some of these uh, archaeologists have proposed that this ingestion of arsenic could have um, accidentally caused uh, stillborn babies and um, uh, perhaps the earliest mummies that we find are actually of stillborn babies. Um, and children. So it's thought that perhaps um, this naturally led to people wanting to keep um, their babies near them. Um, and then uh, we begin to see the process being used on adults as well. So they ended up turning these bodies of their loved ones into ornamental objects. Um, and this um, kind of builds on ideas uh, of immortality and um, the deceased staying with you um, long after their death. Um, and so we uh, end up seeing this um, occur as a set-aside body sculpture. So that's why we're including it with art. Um, a lot of these uh, mummy effigies that they would create are truly multimedia sculptural pieces. So uh, what they would do is they would remove the skin from the deceased 
um, remove the internal organs and the flesh um, to avoid them rotting away. Um, they would allow the bones to dry and they would create a frame, a framework um, with that skeleton, add things like cotton and plant fibers um, to kind of uh, fill out the body. Um, sometimes uh, they would use um, seal skin or make clay masks to help the faces look more lifelike. Um, meanwhile, they would keep the skins in um, like pond water to keep them flexible and uh, help them not rot away. Um, and then they would sew the skin back onto this frame. Um, again, oftentimes the faces are covered with um, masks, but not all of them. Um, one thing that we see very commonly with these chinchoros mummies is a lot of times their mouths are left open, um, which leaves this idea that this would help them um, seem more like they're alive, like they can speak, they can breathe, potentially eat um, with having um, these mouths open. Um, the chinchoros mummies, many of them were buried um, very shallowly um, under sand, um, and they a lot of them are still there. Um, I'm going to put a content warning for the next slide. If you don't want to see a child mummy, just go to another tab for a moment, and I'll let you know when it's not on the screen. Um, so this is an example of a chinchoro child mummy. Um, you can see how well preserved um, it is. Uh, and again, um, yes, yeah, so they used a lot of multimedia things. It's not just human remains. Um, they did uh, dress them up. They would put them in these woven mats. Um, and inconsistencies in carbon dating um, oftentimes shows that the mummies are a lot older than the cloths and the textiles and the mats that they're wrapped up in, uh, which leads scholar leave scholars to believe that these mummies continued to be interacted with, um, refreshed, and given new clothes periodically throughout um, their lives. So this shows a continuity of culture, uh, people being interested in um, returning to the dead and making sure that they have um, fresh, nice clothing um, and things to be wrapped up in. Um, today, uh, changing climates do kind of threaten these mummies that have been well preserved for some of them over 7,000 years. Um, and some of the kind of warming and more um, humidity in, in these regions is uh, threatening um, some of these mummies that have stayed very, very dry and uh, able to not decay for around 7,000 years. Um, all right, I'm going to get rid of that slide. So if you left, you can come back. We're now going to look at um, another artistic phenomenon um, from the lithic period. Um, these are figurines uh, that are known as uh, Valdivia figurines. So we start to see Valdivia figurines um, along the central Andes and north to present day Ecuador um, around 4000 BCE um, and uh, beyond that as well. Uh, most of these figurines are made out of clay and they depict, um, for the vast majority of them, they depict women. Um, some of them include men and we do have a few examples of intersex um, individuals, uh, but again, they're most commonly women. Um, I'll show you an example of one that shows a two-headed and two-torsoed woman. So most, but most of them do look anatomically female. Um, there are suggestions that perhaps these were used as fertility objects um, or that perhaps they were used as um, uh, fertility charms and then ritually killed or disposed of after, say, um, you got pregnant or whatever it was that you wanted to have happen with the power of this Valdivia doll. Um, it seems as though they were um, used in that way. Uh, we also see this idea of vivifying objects in um, indigenous American art. Um, so that's this idea that these, these uh, works of what we would call art are considered to be um, imbued with some sort of power, some sort of uh, vital energy or life force. Um, we do see this tradition of wrapping and dressing art objects, including mummies, um, in the indigenous Americas. Um, and so this is just something I wanted to touch on really quickly. This is an example of a one of these Valdivia figurines. This one's of a woman um, from about 2000 BCE. Um, many times they have hair that's almost cape-like. 
Um, usually the breasts are accentuated. Uh, typically they have arms really close to their bodies. Um, and then their legs are usually kind of in a wide stance, per perhaps for standing up. Um, this one is only 8.3 centimeters tall. Um, so it's pretty small. Uh, these are very portable objects. Um, and if you've taken art history, uh, like Western survey art history, uh, you'll also see that many other cultures in other parts of the world um, have these early traditions of having these female, very small portable effigy figures. Um, here's a set of them um, from about 3500 BCE. Um, these ones are from modern day Ecuador. Um, and you can see that many of these figurines uh, bear very similar features to each other. Um, so kind of simplified, but they do have faces that have been etched in. Um, and uh, yeah, most of these most of these figurines are thought to be associated with either fertility or perhaps even agricultural rit rituals calling um, for rain. Um, some of them show evidence of being intentionally bro uh, broken or thrown against a hard wall. Um, this, again, may lead to this idea of the ritual death of an object, which is something that is a theme that you're going to see throughout this class, that um, many times objects are ritually broken after they have accomplished their purpose, and they may have some sort of um, burial or, like, funeral uh, held for them. Um, so most of these figures are between about 4 and 20 centimeters in height. Um, the vast majority of them are stone, shown standing, um, and there are very few of them that are shown in sitting position. Um, and here's an example that's from the Metropolitan Museum of Art that shows uh, a very interesting um, duality being presented. This one shows um, two heads, um, two shoulders, and then one set of arms and one set of legs. Um, so they're kind of mirror imaged of each other. And again, these could be interpreted as fertility figures or guardian sp uh, spirits. Um, we don't have written records, so we're not sure exactly how they were used, but we do find a lot of them from this time period. These ones are dated from around 2300 um, to 2200 BCE. Uh, and then at the end of the lithic period, we do see a bit of a gap in the artistic record. So around 3000 BCE, um, the last big melting glaciers from the, the last great ice age caused the sea to actually rise along the western coast of South America. Um, so during this time, we probably lost a lot of coastal settlements, settlements to the rising um, ocean levels. So unfortunately, we do have a bit of a gap here at the end of the lithic period. The cotton pre-ceramic period, or sometimes just called the pre-ceramic period, is the period of time between 3000 and 1800 BCE, where we see huge strides being made in fiber arts. Um, at Waka Prieta, we see examples of twine textiles and fishing nets over 98 feet long. Um, we see examples of folks making um, complicated designs in their textiles without the use of a loom. Um, and then in cotton pre-ceramic period, we see um, strides taken in monumental architecture. Some of these architectural motifs include circular courtyards, temples, artificial mounds, uh, and plazas. So this shows us that people are uh, moving to and living in cities uh, where they have enough social cohesion uh, to build these monumental works of architecture, which of course would take the effort of a lot of people um, that are united through some sort of um, cultural vision or religious um, end goals uh, that are willing to work together. Um, as far as art pieces go, um, we'll see uh, pieces made from carved gourds, bone and shell jewelry, um, copper sheet metal, um, wooden earplugs, carved bowls, feathers, clay figurines, and of course mirrors. And then uh, we also see uh, evidence of the practices of burning cloth offerings, uh, taking of human heads, uh, and long distance trade, which uh, is when we see things like spondylus shells from the coast way up in the highlands or feathers from uh, the Amazon in the highlands or on the coast. Um, so we do see evidence of um, very highly organized trade routes uh, during this cotton pre-ceramic period. Um, so the first spot we'll look at is uh, Waka Prieta. Um, this is located uh, on the coast 
And um, this is where we see evidence of some really early textile techniques that are mastered without the use of a loom. So a loom is this um, structured piece for, for weaving. Um, but we see people here are doing techniques like twining and knotting, uh, which you don't need that framework of a loom for. Um, we see open work tradition used in fishing nets and bags, so very practical purposes um, for these uh, techniques. So here we see right along the coastline, we have the Waka Prieta Mound. Um, and here are some of the locations where we've found some of these uh, discarded um, textile scraps. So some of the complex image design graphics that have been discovered when looking really closely at these fa uh, fabric scraps include raptors, double-headed birds, cr crabs transforming into snakes, and other fantastical images. Um, this is a textile fragment um, with the design recreation from Waka Prieta. Um, this shows um, a uh, probably some sort of eagle or condor, um, some sort of raptor, um, with either a snake on top of or inside of its belly. And this was made using the twining technique. So this is um, something that you can do without the use of a loom. Um, but we see that the people uh, at this time were making very complicated designs. Um, so this one is from 2500 BCE. Uh, it's from the cotton pre-ceramic period. Um, and we see this uh, eagle or or condor, some sort of raptor with this snake either inside or on top of its belly. So um, this is that Andean idea of uku, so this idea that what is inside, what is covered, um, will be made revealed and um, will express itself outwardly. Here's another design from Waka Prieta. Um, this shows uh, what kind of looks like two birds kind of uh, writhing next to each other. Um, we see this theme of duality. Um, being present in this design from Waka Prieta. Of course, these are really, really old fabric scraps. So this one's from about 2500 BCE. Um, so it takes a bit of a close analysis to see the different pigment remnants um, to um, reveal these designs. But here we see these designs uh, being revealed. And this particular design could be a representation of Aini or that right relationship where two are becoming a whole where two come together and create um, a more noble third um, aspect. We also see ideas of duality and transformation in this particular scrap um, from another piece of fabric at Waka Prieta. Um, this one shows crabs that seem to be transforming into snakes. So the bottom of these bodies look like crabs, but we see um, emerging from their bodies are these um, smiley faces which um, are moving in a serpentine pattern. We also see that they're connected to each other. So again, we have that idea of duality to making a whole and also transformation, uh, which could be very early examples of shamanic transformation, which is something that we'll um, really explore um, in this lecture and just throughout this class looking at art from the Andes. Another technique that's being employed here is something called contour rivalry. Contour rivalry is where if you spin an object around, um, you can see different things. So contour rivalry is defined as the same lines creating two different gestures. Um, you may be familiar with this image where uh, somebody asks you uh, what kind of animal you see here. Do you see a duck? When I mention duck, perhaps you can see this as a duck head, um, or I might ask, do you see a rabbit? And maybe when I suggest a rabbit, you can see how this might be interpreted as a rabbit. Um, we really see this a lot um, in Andean art, um, and we see it here with this uh, crab image, which as you tip it around and suggest, you know, do you see a snake or do you see a crab? You can kind of see it in different ways. So uh, we'll see this a lot in uh, other art from this time period as well. So let's take a look at cotton pre-ceramic monumental architecture. Um, so again, circular courtyards, temples, artificial mounds, and plazas are some very important milestones from this uh, period. Um, and um, somebody, some of these, some of these uh, centers included several thousand people living in them um, and structures built and rebuilt over time. 
Um, and so when we talk about the uh, rise of civilization, we're just talking about people living in cities. So we have cultures that are not necessarily civilizations because they didn't build cities. So uh, we'll be looking at some different civ civilizations. And one of the first civilizations uh, is one that's thought to be perhaps the oldest in all of the Americas. Um, this is um, a culture based around the site of Corral in the Supe River Valley. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the Norte Chico culture or the Corral Supe culture. Um, this one is uh, based in the Croton pre-ceramic period. Um, its time frame is around 3000 to 1500 BCE. Um, it is probably the earliest New World civilization um, and there are a few challenges to that right now, but as of right now, it's considered to probably be the earliest New World civilization. Um, and it wasn't really seriously excavated until um, 2003 and 2004. So if you're looking at older books about the art of the Andes, um, they might tell you that the Shabin culture is the oldest, and that's just because we didn't know um, about um, the dating here at Corral. Um, so again, uh, with a lot of ancient art and ancient art history, um, we have to be open-minded and willing to kind of adjust our timelines and our assumptions when we're presented with um, new scientific um, information. This culture is oftentimes referred to as a mother culture of later Andean civilizations because we see um, we see objects from uh, Carl that, uh, like the quipu, um, that are used into the Inca period. The Inca uh, were the last great empire before the arrival of the Spanish in the 16th century. So a quipu is a very important uh, recording device used in Andean cultures. Um, it's a device used for recording information and it consists of variously colored threads knotted in different ways. Um, unfortunately, uh, many of these quipus cannot be um, interpreted anymore, um, but we do know that they used sometimes uh, binary code uh, to encode information. We know that the different knots that they used could mean different things and that the different colors they used could uh, mean different things. So these were probably used as counting devices um, and some have suggested that they could also record um, historical um, things and chronological information on them as well. However, unfortunately, um, they are, for the most part, not um, decoded at this time. Um, so we know that they did record information and uh, we know that they had been using them uh, for as long as 5,000 years because we find evidence of them at Corral. Um, so the sacred city of Corral, also called Corral Supe, um, is situated in a dry te desert terrace. It overlooks the Supe River um, and uh, it's very well preserved and it shows a lot of complexity of monumental architecture. It includes monumental stone and earthen platform mounds. Um, it includes sunken circular courtyards. Um, there are around 18 urban settlements in the Supe Valley, uh, but Corral is um, the most complex and the largest, and it includes six large pyramidal structures. Um, the city's plan includes uh, these pyramidal structures, um, and it also shows um, elite residences, uh, which show evidence of uh, ceremonial functions being taken place at this site and um, some sort of religious or political hierarchy as well. So this is what the sacred city of Karal Supe looks like today. Um, it's dated around circa 2600 BCE. It's located in Peru. And uh, just for a reference, we do have pyramidal structures here. And um, this being dated around 2600 BCE, this predates the Great Pyramids at Giza. Um, this is pretty close to the time period that the Step Pyramid of Djoser was being uh, completed in ancient Egypt. Uh, but these pyramidal structures are, again, right on par, if not a little bit earlier than the, than the pyramidal structures that we see in Egypt. Um, and again, these are pretty recent discoveries, pretty recent dating. Um, and this kind of shakes our worldview of, um, you know, the Americas being so much newer than the 
so-called old world. Um, so we do see evidence of very early civilization here in the Americas. All right, um, here's um, another uh, photo of some of these pyramidal structures uh, at the sacred city of Kural. Um, we see that they are stepped. Um, again, a pyramid is basically a very stable way to create an artificial mountain. Um, you have a very large base, it gets smaller as you get up to the top. Um, and across cultures, across the world, we see these used um, for oftentimes religious purposes. Here we have a map of the structures discovered at Karl Supe. And this is the so-called Great Pyramid at Karl Supe. Um, it's now recognized as very early evidence of major coastal settlements with advanced ceremonial practices. Again, this is from the cotton pre-ceramic period. We have um, this very large circular sunken courtyard, which was probably used for uh, religious ceremonies. We have stairways leading up into this large pyramidal structure. Um, and let's pop onto uh, Google Maps and just take a look at this um, from the perspective of Google Maps. So it's a very dry area today. Um, uh, as you recall from the introductory lecture, um, the coast of Peru oftentimes gets less than one inch of rain a year. Uh, but remember, they are located in a river valley. Um, and so people pretty quickly began to develop irrigation techniques that would um, channel the water from the uh, year-round snowmelt and glacial melt from the Andes Mountains and uh, use it uh, for agriculture. So here we are back at the Great Pyramid of Corral. Uh, this is another photograph of that sunken courtyard. Um, very large. Uh, you can see that it's made by stone. Um, again, people coming together and living in cities does require at least some sort of uh, organization and leadership, um, and we do see evidence of that here at Corral. This is a reconstruction by the architect Dennis R. Holloway. Uh, he reconstructs what this um, structure may have originally looked like. Um, it may have had a roof. Uh, however, again, this place doesn't really get much rain. Um, here we have a zoomed out image where we see those uh, pyramidal structures um, and these um, circular courtyards. And that is the Supe River. And the green shows uh, evidence of greenery around it. Um, this is an example of some carved faces from the Supe Valley in Peru. Um, so we do have evidence of people um, creating monumental works of figurative art as well. Um, here we see a human head. We have some snake motifs um, and this uh, almost like cartoon ghost-like figure. Um, so these are uh, a little bit of highlights from uh, the Caral Supe or um, Chico Norte culture. The next cotton pre-ceramic period site we'll check out is the site of Kotosh. Uh, Kotosh is located uh, right in here um, and it consisted of two mounds, two artificially made mounds, uh, one of which contained the Temple of the Crossed Hands, which had been very carefully uh, filled in with imported sand to preserve it. Um, and probably ritually bury it. So again, we're going back to this idea of art and architecture viewed as something that is living that can also die and um, have some sort of um, death or funeral rites attached to it. Um, in the temple of uh, the so-called temple of the crossed hands, uh, we have uh, two different sets of uh, these uh, relief carvings of, of crossed hands. Uh, we have this idea of duality and uh, kariwarmi. Um, we have uh, one set of hands that is slightly larger than the other one. And this has been interpreted as perhaps being a male-female couple, um, which is that concept of kariwarmi. So uh, Kotosh was first constructed in 2450 BCE. Um, again, there's two main mounds at the site. And um, this site features uh, mounds with small mason relief temples. Uh, they, were, they included painted and plastered walls that featured niches um, and mud reliefs uh, and central fire pits. And then we call this uh, idea of carefully burying a, a sacred temple or some sacred building as temple entombment, where they're intentionally trying to preserve it and honor it, um, but discontinue its use or let it kind of ritually die. 
So the crossed arm details in the Temple of the Crossed Arms, uh, again, include one larger and one smaller, uh, which may be a representation of this idea of kariwami, which is a Inca term. Um, this refers to gender balance. It literally means man-woman. So it's this idea of having representations of both um, male and female or masculine and feminine um, ideas or representations. So this is the interior uh, view of the uh, Temple of the Crossed Hands at Kotosh. So we see these... Um, these niches inside of the temple. Um, and then here we have those crossed hands where we get this idea of the crossed hands. Um, it's from 2450 BCE. Um, and it's important to note that these hands do show um, that the people making them were interested in uh, being anatomically accurate. Uh, we do see the correct number of digits on these hands. We see them realistically overlapping in space. Um, we don't always see naturalism as a, as a priority or a goal um, in all uh, early Andean cultures. So it is important to note uh, this effort for being anatomically accurate and naturalistic um, in this example. Uh, rock art can be dated to the pre-ceramic period, and it can be found in many areas throughout the uh, Andean uh, regions of Peru. Um, typically, one of the main subjects that we see in uh, rock art from the pre-ceramic period includes uh, pictographs of camelids, which of course include um, llamas and uh, alpacas and vicuñas. Um, oftentimes, these include um, human figures. Um, most of the time, they're done in red uh, color. And at Kushimashe, um, we have an example of what is thought to be a hunting camp in the high grasslands. Um, and we see red pigments that are mainly focused on depicting pregnant vicuña, uh, which are the wild cousins of the domesticated llama and alpaca. Uh, here we'll notice that artists use the natural curves of the rock uh, to make their creations look, look and feel a little bit more three-dimensional. So these are probably showing um, that the hunters and these societies that were required um, hunting and relying on materials from these animals, that they were very interested in the fertility of these animals. Um, we don't always think about that. Maybe today we always think about hunters just wanting to kill things. However, you need to have these animals have a healthy population, um, healthy reproduction in order for them to be for there to be enough of them to actually hunt sustainably. So uh, this one is a rock painting of pregnant vicuñas from Kuchimashe. Um, and we see that they're pregnant with these kind of swollen bellies. The bellies are really, really emphasized. Um, and then the heads and the feet um, are shown super, super tiny. So we can see uh, that the pregnant bellies seem to be what's emphasized in many of these uh, rock paintings from the cotton pre-ceramic period. Um, and many of these of this rock art is, is dated by the organic materials that are found in the cave with them. Um, so it is possible that they could be a bit older um, than what we uh, see them dated as. Um, this is an example of a rock painting. Um, this one's shown under some special light to show the different um, pigments that are pretty faded today. Um, and this one seems to show um, like a x-ray vision of a uh, little fetus um, and the birth canal. So again, that idea of fertility um, is very much um, accentuated in this artwork. Next, we're going to jump into the initial period. The initial period is um, approximately 1800 to 800 BCE. Um, during the initial period, we see um, much more intensive farming. Uh, along the coastline, utilizing the um, irrigation techniques from the year-round uh, water that's available in rivers. We also see people moving to more sedentary lifestyles. Um, we see larger settlements uh, with religious architecture, including U-shaped structures. So this is something a bit new that we see in the initial period illustrated over here. Um, in the initial period, we see the introduction of the loom so that um, a more rigid structure for creating large works of textile. Uh, in the mountain regions, we see that herders are still seasonally migrating 
Um, and on the coast, we see a lot of fishing and agriculture uh, really flourishing. Uh, this is an example of a reconstruction drawing of the U-shaped uh, Waka La Florida. And remember that uh, a Waka is just a sacred place or a sacred object. Uh, so Waka La Florida um, is dated to around 2000 BCE. And this arrangement of long mounds flanking a taller one um, is very typical of early coastal architecture during the initial period. Oftentimes these U-shaped configurations would face a sacred direction or in this case uh, along the coast oftentimes we see these u-shaped um, structures facing the mountains for these coastal communities where they did not get hardly any rainfall or they got hardly any rainfall um, the mountains were very very important because those snow-capped mountains are the source of their water uh, the source of their irrigation for them to have their livelihoods and grow their crops um, in the inca we have in the inca culture, um, we have a word for this. Uh, they're called apus. So um, an apu literally just means a mountain, but it also means a lord. Um, so these apus are kind of these personified lords or these kind of sacred and honored high places where snow melt and water sources come from for many of these people along the coast. So one of these sites that we'll check out next is called uh, Pampa de las Lamas Moheque. Um, it's sometimes also spelled with a Q, so if you're doing other research and you see it spelled with a Q, um, same thing, of course, it wasn't originally meant to be spelled in English. Um, this location, also sometimes just called Moheke, I'll just call it Moheke um, from now on, but this is its full name. Um, Moheke was inhabited from about 1800 to 1200 BCE, so it is in the initial period. Um, and we have two large mounds with a plaza. Um, this is a, an oasis in the desert in Peru, um, and the largest mound was a temple, which includes anthropomorphic structures. It's located in the Cosma Valley, um, which includes um, more than 50 rivers that flow from east to west, carrying water towards the Peruvian Pacific coast. Um, let's take a look at what this... Um, what the site looked like. So they were kind of close to the coast, which allowed them to have access uh, of the rich uh, marine resources associated with the coast. Today, um, it's obviously been reduced, um, but you can see this very, very large um, coastal settlement. You can see uh, the erosion that shows um, water has flown through here um, somewhat recently, and you can see um, that irrigation is being taken place in the modern context um, right here. All right, back over here. Um, the uh, center of this very large polity um, was constructed on an area of about 550 acres, and um, all of the site's architecture is built of stone set in mud mortar. So these are people building stone architecture. This is the main structure at Moheke. Um, it is a sunk, it is a uh, built up kind of stepped up structure that includes sunken um, courtyards atop these platforms. So kind of um, melding this idea of sort of stepped pyramidal structures with those uh, indented courtyards. Um, and they include huge adobe, adobe structures that faced outwards to announce the power of the people who inhabited these large um, structures. So here's an example of this main structure at Moheke. Um, we have these series of steps that went up um, and then down into this sunken courtyard. So we have this idea of um, separation from the uh, lower, um, lower accesses. So um, typically in architecture, when you see a very large space that only has one access point, it's meant to control access. So this oftentimes might speak to um, social and political hierarchy. Um, these are some some images of the now semi-fragmentary um, large adobe structures that were on top of the um, Moheke um, main structure. Uh, this includes a caped figure, um, a shamanic being uh, that's emanating snakes, which is this fragment right here, and a head with these um, stripes going down its face and it's showing its teeth. So 
Um, these may refer to shamanistic transformations, uh, but let's just make sure we're all on the same page and we know what shamanism is because um, it is a very important um, spiritual practice uh, that may date very, very far back into the history of the Andes, and it is still practiced and in the Andes today in some communities. So shamanism is a spiritual practice and religion that involves a shaman or a religious specialist that uses altered states of consciousness to connect with the spirit world. We see many examples of shamanism across um, the world and across cultures, so it is not exclusive to the Andes, uh, but different regions will kind of have different interpretations and ways in which shamans practice. Um, many indigenous American shamans believed were believed to actually transform into animal beings or animal selves during their altered states of consciousness. Um, and for many uh, shamans in the Andean re region, um, they would utilize um, entheogenic or psychedelic plants um, in order to um, induce these uh, visions and states of consciousness. So this is an example that we'll look at from Shavin a bit later, where we have a um, person who's probably a shaman who seems to be transforming into um, a jaguar, and he's holding onto a San Pedro cactus, which is the source of um, entheogenic substances. So we might see that happening here um, with this kind of grimacing face with uh, these stripes coming down the cheeks, uh, with these snakes emanating from one of these figures. So this could be um, an early example of shamanic transformation from the initial period. Um, this image right here shows where these um, adobe figures were located on that original structure. Um, next, we're going to look at some uh, examples of monumental architecture and sculpture from uh, Huaca de los Reyes at Caballo Muerto and Garagay. So here we see an impressive statue and relief artwork, including faces that feature pendant eye pupils. Pendant eye pupils are very reminiscent of the way jaguar eyes look like when they're stalking their prey. Um, we see wide feline noses, drawn back lips with feline fangs, snake emulations, talons, and claws. Many of these uh, are animal features that are placed on human faces. So again, we get this idea of um, sh uh, shamans uh, transforming into their animal selves uh, in order to connect with the spirit world um, and gain information and divination that might help their communities. So here we have, um, obviously this is not the best preserved, uh, but again, it is from 1800 to 800 BCE, so it is pretty old. Uh, this is a huge sculpture of a feline head at Huaca de los Reyes. Um, at the mound of Caballo Muerto on the north coast. Um, this is made from adobe. Um, it was probably originally painted. Uh, it hasn't entirely survived, uh, but we do see this um, snarling face with these feline type fangs, this kind of wide jaguar-like nose. Um, and if you can think back to the weird jaguars of the Olmec culture, um, these, this might be a similar theme of uh, transformation. Um, this is from the site of Garage. Um, this includes these polychrome adobe friezes. So remember, friezes are um, usually shallow carved um, features, typically on the outside or inside of a building. So here we have um, polychrome or many colored friezes from the central coast site of Garage, which feature spiders and insects combined with humans. Um, here we see some a uh, kind of humanoid face, but it's also combined with features of a spider. So uh, this crisscross woven pattern around it could potentially represent um, a spider web. We do know that Inca shamans would sometimes use spiders for their divination, for um, finding things out from the spirit world or about the future. They would sometimes use spiders. Um, here we have a uh, this fanged face, so the fangs are reminiscent of spiders, and uh, this element that emerges from the nose could be a reference to the spider's um, uh, pincher, also called a pedipalp, or it could refer to the mucus secretions um, that your body reacts to from uh, snuffing the entheogen. Um, I might butcher pronouncing this, but it's... Um, Anandanonthera, which is also called Vilca by the Inca. 
Um, the tooth fangs are on the top, which is uh, also reminiscent of a spider. Um, but we don't just have spider transformations, but we, there's more. We also have, um, well, actually this one is kind of spider looking, but it also has almost like a hawk tail on it. So these are definitely some sort of transformational images. Um, they definitely don't just look like spiders or just look like um, birds. They seem to be combining a lot of the features. Um, this one almost looks like it has a jaguar head. So we definitely see some sort, some form of uh, transformation and kind of extraordinary type creatures. All right, next we'll move on to another initial period site of uh, Cerro Seixin. Um, this one's located along the coast of modern day Peru. Um, here we have an example of a walled temple. Um, on the outside of this walled temple, we have these very interesting relief carvings. Um, these include uh, individuals with staffs that seem to be in charge, and they are leading dead and dismembered individuals uh, around the border. There are also images of toad eggs here, uh, which may reference entheogens because some uh, poisonous frogs have substances that can induce visions in human beings. So some interpretations of this site vary from um, shamanic initiation, where um, the person going through the shamanic in, uh, initiation and going through these visions might feel like they are initially being um, dismembered, uh, or it could also reference an actual massacre um, in which people were literally um, dismembered. So um, here's an image of uh, the temple. And over 300 slabs depict dismembered bodies, severed torso, or decapitated heads. Um, these stone slabs are about 10 feet tall each. So this is definitely um, an effort um, to show you, maybe scare you off from wanting to enter this temple, or just let you know how serious um, the people are dealing with these um, dealing with these rituals inside of the temple. Um, again, this is uh, could be a reference to shamanism um, or folks uh, gaining access to the spirit world via um, transformation. And I thought I'd include this little meme from CNN uh, where in the United States, uh, the National Park had to actually ask people to stop licking the psychedelic toads uh, because people were picking them up and uh, licking them to try to um, experience visions. Uh, but that's not very nice to do to toads that are just trying to live their lives. So please don't lick the psychedelic toads. Um, you've heard it from the National Park. All right, this is um, a detail of uh, Cerro Sishin's walled um, temple. Here are some more details showing the staffed individuals, which are definitely shown to be alive uh, and animate. Um, kind of directing all of these dismembered heads that have closed eyes and closed mouths, uh, which is probably indicating that they are deceased. Um, there are many, many, many of these images. Remember, there's over 300 of them, um, and they all seem to depict these staffed individuals and dismembered body parts. Um, so this is what it looks like today. It's a lot of it. And um, here is the entryway to the temple. Um, we see these very large um, monoliths. So remember, it could be, could be actual dismemberment or it could be um, kind of the very uh, sometimes disturbing visions that people go through um, when ingesting these entheogens and going through these visions. All right, we're going to jump into uh, the culture at Chavin de Huantar, um, dated from about 1100 to 500 BCE. Um, remember, this was previously thought to be the oldest culture in um, the Andes. However, um, again, we do know that the uh, Chico Norte culture um, at Caral and the Supe Valley does date to quite a bit earlier than this. Uh, but Chavin de Huantar definitely had a huge influence throughout um, the coastal Andean region. We see them uh, positioned in the late initial period, um, and we will see a lot of 
uh, the concepts, ideas, and even deities presented at Chavin de Huantar, we will see them spread uh, to later cultures, including um, the uh, Wari and the Mochi. So um, some of the features that we see at Chavin include circular courtyards, U-shaped structures, images of jaguars, snakes, and human-animal transformations. Um, we'll also see that um, the influence of the Chavin style is spread um, up to 500 miles away. Um, we do see textiles in the Chavin style stretching all the way to Karwa, uh, which is in the south. Um, and the uh, location of Chavin de Wantar is built at a tinku. So it's this location where two rivers, um, the Monsa and the Wachesca, uh, meet, which um, in Andean thought was uh, kind of a sacred spot where those two rivers are um, meeting. So um, first we'll look at, uh, we'll mostly be focusing on the temple structure here at Shabin de Wantar, although it is a much larger total site. Um, so we'll look at the old temple, which is the subterranean gallery location of the Lanzon, which is a very important art piece. We'll also look at some uh, carvings in the new temple. There's a U-shaped plaza in the old temple with a circular sunken courtyard. And then later we see this larger U-shaped courtyard with a rectangular courtyard. Um, but again, that is, um, that is built later. Um, originally, when this was first discovered, people mislabeled the temple as a castillo or a castle. Um, but we now know that it, was, it functioned as a temple. Um, and the temple is over 330 feet uh, across the back and over 52 feet high. So this was a three plus story building, which is pretty impressive considering it was built around 3000 years ago. Um, it was uh, susceptible to earthquakes, but has uh, surprisingly survived pretty well. Um, an earthquake in 500 BCE probably ended its ceremonial uh, use though. And these ceremonial precincts face the Monsa River. So a lot of times the U-shapes are gonna face a sacred direction. In this case, it's that river where they're getting um, their livelihood from. So this is kind of an aerial view of what this looks like today. So we're over that rectangular plaza. Um, and here we have um, the remnants of the temple. So this is the new temple over here, the old temple over here. Uh, the site of the Lanzon, uh, which is a work of art we'll look at next, is here. And then that um, original circular shaped um, plaza is right down here. So I love using Google Maps. You can really kind of get an idea of what um, these different locations looked and feel, felt like. So it's located in this really beautiful valley um, with this river uh, providing them um, life and sustenance. So you can see how close the river is. It's right there. And this is the lens on. So what's going on here? So inside of the old temple, um, you can see this on Google Maps. Um, I didn't include it because it, I didn't want to take more time, but there are a lot of uh, kind of confusing hallways and chambers within the old temple. Uh, we call these galleries. Um, buried in the old temple, we also uh, find human remains, which shows uh, potential sacrifices um, or um, you know, rit ritual entombment of people uh, within this temple, probably not people of high status because they're not buried with gifts or anything. They're just buried within kind of the building of the temple. So we do see human burials in here, but we see a lot of confusing chambers and um, hallways. Um, there's also these different drainage things happening uh, going on there. Uh, we know that there's some really interesting acoustic properties of these chambers as well. Uh, but probably the most sacred point in the old temple uh, was this gallery that had very limited light sources um, entering it, um, which encased this really tall, over 15 foot tall natural stone sculpture um, called the Lanzon uh, cult image. Lanzon means great lance in Spanish. Uh, but uh, scholars today think this may have actually more represented a, a plow. This is an example, an illustration of an Andean plow. Um, so if this does represent a plow, it might have more um, connection to agriculture and fertility. Um, 
It also probably functioned as a um, axis mundi or a world tree. Um, we do see uh, twisted motifs along the back side of it, which may relate to um, the twisted vines of um, where the plant where ayahuasca comes from. It's an entheogenic plant, which um, again may be referenced by these twisted motifs on the statue's back. So it may re again relate to this sacred plant that allowed these shamans to have um, their visions. Uh, but when I say that this large sculpture is an axis mundi, um, what I mean by this is that the bottom of it is placed in the earth and then the top of it comes into um, you know, the, the realm where people are living. Um, so when you enter the, this is the sunken plaza. This is a, a view of the plan. We have the sunken circular plaza. You enter through this small, um, entryway. Uh, there's kind of a claustrophobic entryway. And then there's a chamber where the land zone is. So when you walk through this tunneled passageway, the land zone actually, um, is rooted in the ground and comes all the way up, um, uh, kind of above the ceiling and it's uh, decorated and carved with these this like fanged um, uh, fanged probably deity and uh, it has one arm lifted high the other pointed down um, so it's kind of in an exclusive place to get to probably not everybody had access to this cult object you probably had to be some sort of priest or somebody important to enter into this very sacred place to um, view the land zone. Um, what is an axis mundi? So the idea of an axis mundi we see in many different cultures, um, but it can be uh, it can be defined. It's a Latin term. It can be defined as a sacred, spiritual, or holy center that connects earth to heaven and gods to humans. Um, it can appear in many forms. Uh, in some cultures, it can be seen as trees, pillars, ladders, towers, temples, and altars. Um, it is also oftentimes associated with mountains or high places, um, you know, where the earth is meeting the sky. Um, it can also refer to the literal axis of the earth that we live on that runs between the North Pole and the South Pole. Um, it could also relate to the literal axis of rotation of the celestial sphere. Um, so many different world cultures and different religions have a concept of an axis mundi. Um, so, for example, in the Islamic world, the Kaaba in Mecca would probably be um, thought of as an axis mundi. It's the direction that everybody in that culture prays to and people um, walk around this sacred object. Um, we also have the example from the Maya cosmology. We see an example of a tree of life, um, oftentimes in Maya cosmology, as being something that connects kind of the underworld uh, with the realm of the living up with the celestial realm. And we have that example from King Pakal's tomb from the Maya culture. So this idea of him kind of in this space between the jaws of the underworld, the tree of life, and um, kind of these ancestral figures. Um, so we see this in a lot of different cultures, but in um, the Shavin culture, it seems as though this cult statue probably served as some sort of axis mundi. So let's take a look at what's going on with this stone. So the stone is this um, kind of flat and tall figure. It's over 15 feet high. Um, and you probably wouldn't have been able to see the entirety of the sculpture because the room that it's in, um, it's kind of blocked off in some ways. So you'd kind of have to walk around it to see what's happening. It's kind of a blade shaped um, stone. And this image shows a rollout of what it looked like. So you would never actually see it flattened out like this. You would see it from one side or the other. Um, but we have this idea of bilateral symmetry. Um, this image is more or less symmetrical on one side and the other. We see this fanged, snarling face uh, with feline fangs, um, kind of uh, jaguar-shaped nose. Uh, we have these pendant pupils, which is something um, very uh remnant of Shavin art. We have the eyelashes and whiskers and hair um, that terminate in snakes. Um, above it, we have these kind of snake features. Uh, this is definitely an example of contour rivalry because you can see like many different faces in here if you look hard enough. Um, and then the idea that one of its hands, its clawed hands is raised and the other one is pointing down 
Um, again, kind of references it being as a conduit between different celestial, terrestrial, and um, underworld um, spiritual realms. So let's skip back through here. Um, if you notice, its eyelashes and probably its whiskers terminate in these pendant-eyed snakes. Um, so this, uh, again, might speak to shamanic transformation. Uh, we do see um, that the fangs uh, are probably associated with the jaguar, um, which is an animal that actually lives in the jungle. Shavin de Wantar is not located in the jungle. Um, we also see uh, talons that could have uh, associations with the uh, the, ki the caiman, which is uh, related to crocodiles. Um, these are apex predators that are from the jungle lowlands. So we know that the people at Shavin had knowledge of these animals that lived in the jungle. So perhaps um, Shavin was established by people from the jungle, or perhaps there was an established trade route between Shavin um, and the jungles. Um, these um, features are rendered as snakes, um, which can be read as both bodily features and as separate animals. Um, and we do see further visual complexities um, with the animal heads that decorate the bottom of the figure's tunic. So we have even more animal heads down here um, where two snakes share a single fanged mouth. Um, and this is, again, a, an example of contour rivalry, where if you look at things in one way, it looks like one face. You look at it another way, it looks like um, another uh, face. So uh, again, probably only priests had access to actually view this image. Um, and something else that's really cool about the chamber where this uh, Lanzon figure was located is that um, there was um, there were these drainage these drainages throughout these complicated hallways. Um, and during rainstorms, the, the drains would create this weird echoey kind of roaring sound. So not only are you kind of sensory deprived in these chambers in that you can't see a lot of uh, things because there's very limited light sources, you're also hearing these like erratic roaring echoing sounds. So it was probably a super terrifying um, experience, uh, almost like the Wizard of Oz. Um, probably the priests would know that it's just the the drains and the water draining and making these echoey sounds. But um, if you were an initiate and, and you're encountering this sculpture, you're probably thinking it's like echoing and roaring all around you, which would have been kind of terrifying. Um, this is an example of a nose ornament um, from Peru that's made in the Chavin style. Notice that the snake's upturned or its uh, eyes looking upward are very similar to these snakes. Um, this is a nose ornament that would actually be worn on the face. So it's very reminiscent of the snakes emulating out of the Lanzone cult images face, um, but a real person could wear this on their face. All right, next we're gonna move to that circular courtyard just outside of where the Lanzone cult image is stored. Um, the sunken circular courtyard in front of the old temple features um, relief panels of parading shamans. Um, so let's take a look at one of these. Uh, one of these uh, better preserved relief panels shows a shaman with braided snakes for hair. Uh, we see that pendulant pupil, um, the pendant pupil right here. We see this uh, jaguar-like fanged mouth. The person is standing upright um, and they more or less have human form, uh, but we see that their hands and feet look almost like bird talons or um, apex predator claws. Um, and we also see that this individual is parading around with a San Pedro cactus. Um, again, the San Pedro cactus was another source of entheogens. We also have other relief panels, including this transformational jaguar image, um, in which perhaps, a ja um, perhaps these shamans are transforming into jaguars um, and entering into um, that trance-like state where they can communicate with the spirit world. Um, this is another uh, drawing of some of these carved panels um, from the west side of building A. Here we see people with spondylus shells. These are these pink spondylus shells from the coast. They are um, found a lot in modern day Ecuador. Um, this one also has snakes coming off of the headdress. They're wearing these um, beautiful um, uh, outfits. Uh, this one is blowing a conch trumpet. 
which uh, speaks to the multi-sensory experience of being in this temple. So I've already mentioned the roaring sound created by water draining, um, but uh, um, studies of the interior space of the old temple show that the uh, walls would create these really interesting reverberations. So if you blew a conch trumpet, it would reverberate and reverberate on. Um, also singing, you could almost harmonize with yourself with the delay in reverberation um, created by the acoustics inside of the building. So it would be a really crazy multi-sensory multi experience, even if you were not under the influence of any entheogenic um, materials. Uh, on the outside of the temple in Chavin de Huantar, we also have um, interesting sculptural decorations on the outside. Um, so these are things that people walking by the temple could see. You wouldn't have to have special access inside. Um, so we call these tenon heads. Um, they're carved on these uh, stone beams, on the end of these stone beams that are um, planted in the walls, but the um, heads would stick out and almost look like they're floating. Um, these heads show, uh, again, probably shamans in their transformational state. So it kind of advertises what's going on inside of the building. Um, here's an example of one of these tenon heads. So they do look like humans, but they also have these very jaguar-like features. Over a hundred of these tenon heads have been found, and each one is unique and represents the transformation of a shaman into a supernatural feigned creature. Uh, here's another one of these. This one you can see has a lot of mucus coming out of the nostrils, which uh, is probably um, meant to show the body's reaction to um, snuffing these entheogens. Um, this one is looking very jaguar-like. Um, it's another one of these tenon heads from Chavin de Wantar. Um, so they are probably meant to intimidate and also advertise the powers of um, the shamanic transformation that takes place within this um, ritual center. And again, we were looking at the old temple right here. Um, the new temple is over here and then that sunken circular plaza with those reliefs. Um, next, we're gonna take a look at the entrance of the new temple. This is a rollout of drawings that are um, carved on these pillars uh, at the entrance of the new temple at Chavin de Wantar. So these are rollout drawings of the incised figures uh, wrapped around those two columns. Um, they call this the so-called black and white portal because we have light and dark colored rock right next to each other. Um, this is an impressive gateway into the enlarged new temple um, and it summarizes the complementary um, in complementarity in a striking light and dark stone lintel um, uh, where we see a feminine being to the left and a masculine being to the right um, that are being displayed as anthropomorphic avian figures. So we definitely see contour rivalry happening here. Um, these look like two large um, beings, but when you look more closely, you can see faces everywhere. They have faces on their ankles. They have faces on their groins. They have um, snakes coming out of their wings. They have taloned faces coming off of um, the tops of their wings. And of course, they have faces as well. But if you look really closely at their faces, their faces are made up of a bunch of snakes. So what exactly is um, going on here? Uh, well, definitely a lot of things. These figures um, appear somewhat human, but definitely very much avian. Um, they've got uh, arms and legs like a human, but they also have wings. Um, their faces um, are very reminiscent of a uh, hawk for the male. Um, he has a band running through his eye, which a lot of hawks in this area have. Um, and then the female is probably an eagle. Um, she has this pronounced nostril opening, which is uh, very uh, typical of eagles. Um, and uh, how do we know that one is probably uh, feminine and one of them is probably masculine? Well, if we look at their um, groin areas, um, this one on the left has uh, what archaeologists call a vagina dentata. Um, so this means it's got this like fanged mouth kind of over its genital area. And then um, the masculine figure has this central fang 
uh, which most, you know, most animals don't have a central thing in the middle, uh, but it's thought that this is probably um, representing a phallus. So uh, we'll see these concepts repeated throughout um, Andean iconography. So um, just remember if, if it has a thing to vagina dentata, it's probably has a, a feminine connotation. And if it has a central thing in the middle, um, it's probably a um, masculine connotation. And again, these are located um, on these pillars at the entrance of the new temple at Shavin de Wantar. Um, we also have a another very, very famous um, work of religious artwork um, and definitely an, an example of contour rivalry here at Chavine de Wantar. This is a seven foot tall stela that unfortunately was not found in its original location, um, but it is figuratively very similar to um, the black and white portal um, carvings that we just saw. Um, so this is created from uh, granite ashlar, and it was found near the temple of Chavin de Huantar by a man named Antonio uh, Raimondi. So we therefore call it the Raimondi stele after him. It's at the Archaeological Museum in Lima today. But what we see here is this example of this staffed deity. And we will see examples of staffed deities um, in many different cultural contexts in the Andes after this. So this is kind of an, an important figure for you to know about. Um, the, he's later associated with being the um, kind of main deity of the Incas, kind of the creative, the creator deity. Um, he's associated with Viracocha um, for the later Inca um, culture, just so you know. You don't have to know that yet. We don't know if he was called Viracocha back in this time, um, but he is perhaps associated with being a supreme deity. And I know I used um, a masculine pronoun for him just now. We're not sure if this uh, figure is necessarily masculine, but a lot of um, a lot of scholars um, interpret this being as being masculine. Um, but there's not a whole lot to tell us either way. So um, my apologies. I don't know this. I don't know this being's gender. So um, this is a great example of contour rivalry because when we look at it one way, uh, it looks like a figure um, holding two staffs that are kind of swirly and almost snake or plant-like, wearing this gigantic um, headdress that seems to have these snakes pouring out of it. But if we flip it upside down, it looks like this little being flying in the air with two faces and then all these crocodilian faces coming out of it. Um, so there's different ways to view it. Again, that's an example of contour rivalry. Um, if you pause this video and look really closely, I bet you can find a lot of faces here. Um, so this face right here may reference a uh, caiman or this alligator type um, individual or this type of creature that lives in the Amazon. Um, or you can have this short, almost pug-like face that's kind of snarling up here as well. Um, so there's many different ways for viewing this, uh, which again are examples of contour rivalry. Um, but we know that this figure is probably extremely powerful as it's wielding the power of um, these two staffs um, and it's wielding the power of multiple apex predators. Um, and the more you look at it, the more faces you see. So this is known as the staff god of, of Chavin, um, and he is pretty important. You'll see uh, repetitions of this staff god. Um, next, we'll look at some portable art from Chavin de Wantar. Um, so this portable art uh, we find very far away from Chavin and also in Chavin. So at the, the site of Chavin de Wantar, we have examples of religious trees. So at uh, underneath the temple, we see um, offerings, which include shell from the far north, obsidian, which is that volcanic glass from the far south. Uh, we see examples of weaving tools, snuff tubes and tablets or accessories that you would use for ingesting entheogens. Um, and we also see examples of gold work. Um, so all of this examples of objects from very far away located at the temple um, can either speak to us of a vast trade network um, that uh, revolved around Chavin de Huantar, or it can tell us that people from these far stretches of the coast 
um, and the Indian region were coming to Chavin de Huantar uh, as a pilgrimage site, like they were coming there for religious purposes. And perhaps both of those things were happening. Um, we also see that Chavin, we also see Chavin style artwork found at sites hundreds of miles away in different cultural and environmental regions, um, which can mean that the ideas and the imagery from Chavin were spreading outward. So it's probably a two way street here um, of exchange, cultural exchange and probably religious exchange as well. Um, this is an example of a repoussé gold alloy pectoral. Um, this one has been said to have been found at Chavin de Huantar. Uh, here we see that kind of crocodilian feline face with the um, snakes emulating out of it. Um, this one's located at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C. Um, and when I say repoussé, that is a, 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 a type of metalwork which includes uh, hammering a malleable metal from the reverse side to create a design in low relief. So you can do this with copper pretty easily. Gold is also very soft. Um, so that's the um, method that this was created. Um, and we also have these really interesting Chavin style um, nose pieces. This one's a little bit different than the one I showed you last um, time. This one has multiple snakes coming out of it. Um, but it shows us that the priests were probably emulating the um, motifs of snakes um, emerging from the facial features that we see in some of the um, cult images. Uh, here's another example of gold metallurgy from uh, this time period. Um, this is a gold repoussé crown um, that's nine and a quarter inches tall. I actually saw this in person um, when I was interning at the Smithsonian, we got to see a lot of the storerooms of stuff that wasn't on display. And I got to see these Shabin style crowns, uh, which was so cool. They were having some work done on them. Um, but this one was found um, really far on the North Coast. But what we see here is a representation of the supernatural Shavin staff bearer, also known as the staff god that we saw on the Raimondi stela just a moment ago. Um, this style is called uh, Kupiznike, um, but it's also very reminiscent of Shavin. So this shows that these ideas of the staff bearer god um, were very widespread at this time. This is a close up. Can you see some of these little faces here? Um, here an artist has very kindly drawn some of these multiple faces. So we have that more like squat pug like face. And we also have that more like feline or crocodilian face um, as well. This one has the um, kind of bird, uh, bird of prey claws at the bottom. And you can see that the fists are holding these staffs, again, associated with this um, so-called staff deity. We also see um, references of the staff deity in um, textiles from this time period. So here again, we see some contour rivalry. We see um, different fanged faces, um, depending on how we look at it. Uh, we also see this central figure who seems to be holding onto some staffs. This one is shown probably male with this central um, fang in the middle um, there. So uh, again, prob that's probably a masculine um, representation of the staff god. Um, and uh, this is a drawing um, of a painted South Coastal Karwa textile, which represents uh, parading jaguars. So this is very similar to what we saw at the sunken circular plaza at Chavin de Huantar. Um, we see multiple kind of fanged mouths, depending on how we look at it, these snake eyes. Um, but this is probably some showing some sort of shamanic transformation. And it's very reminiscent of this um, shamanic parading um, jaguar that we saw in the sunken court at Chavin de Huantar. This is another drawing of a painted Karwa textile. This one shows a female uh, deity figure. We see the vagina dentata here. We also see um, breast motifs that are almost personified as these um, pendulant pupil eyes. Um, this figure has a kind of terrifying fanged mouth. Um, she is also holding two staffs um, in that authoritative uh, picture. Um, and just to remind you, Karwa was located um, over 500 miles away from Chavin de Huantar um, on the south coast. So this shows that Chavin, these ideas, um, religious ideas that are present at Chavin are present um, very far north and very far, far south on the coast. So we do see a lot of 
uh, continuity there. Um, the staffs that she's holding terminate in these fanged kind of monster heads as well. And she has this really impressive headdress. Um, we also see uh, Kupisnikwe style uh, ceramic stirrup spout vessels um, that show similar pendant pupils and fanged faces and kind of snake-like um, undulations that are similar to Chavine art. Um, and so um, this one is, this one on the right is a Santa Ana style stirrup spout vessel, um, which is a sub-style of Chavine style ceramics. Um, this one is distinctive. It has red and black coloration. Um, and then this one on the left is the Kupis, uh, Nike style um, stirrup spout vessel um, in a blackware technique where we have these um, kind of transformational contour rivalry type uh, pendant irises, fang, crossed fangs, um, and serpentine lines, which we see in um, Chavine art. So uh, again, this really does speak to the cultural influence of Chavine and a lot of the shared um, imagery, iconography, and probably religious ideas that people um, all along the um, Peruvian coast were experiencing. So um, that's where we'll end today. Um, this is just a little bit of a review of the different time periods and sites that we looked at um, in this um, chapter and in this lecture. So I'll see you next time. Um, we'll uh, dive into uh, Paracas and Nazca art next time, and um, I'll see you then.